Hi guys, Sonova here. I hope you can hear me okay. I'm having a little bit of problems with my sound, uh, but let me double check here, see if I can if I can get this to work right. I hope you guys are doing all right. I am uh, at this point. I am in the middle of. There we go. Hopefully that works. I'm gonna check over here, see if it's if the sounds okay, and then we'll get started. I uh, have some announcements to make. Let's see if this sounds. Okay, that works. Okay. I have uh, this book that I wrote several years ago, Dawn of the Dixie Mafia. I actually have two Dixie Mafia books I wrote. Um, this one is the second one. Uh, but I, I literally only have three left on my bookshelf. So if anyone wants them, you can reach out to me. I can tell you how to get them. But uh, I have spent several years trying to kind of separate from the true crime genre and go into life coaching for victims, family members, and things like that. And I'm constantly being pulled back into the world of true crime and cold cases. And quite frankly, I miss all the true crime and cold cases. I miss all the research and all of that stuff. If you hear some tapping, it's because my uh, little Bichon is tap tapping around instead of laying down where he's supposed to with mommy. Um, so, but anyways, I, I have been torn for a long time. I just haven't really felt, um, really enjoying what I do for quite a while, but I, um, I have gotten called back over and over and over again into the world of true crime because of this case that comes around this book. Um, those of you that don't know, about 11 months ago, I was uh, I was uh, sent out to Tennessee to um, to be filmed by a uh, a film crew for the Discovery Channel's TV show Moonshiners. And I was actually on that show for Moonshiners. They filmed me for 10 hours um, and uh, had a great time. You know, it was a paid trip out there and I got to take my kids and they got to have a good time while mommy was working. Um, and all of that was great and good. Um, but I still wasn't back into the world of true crime. But it's the story of Buford Pusser and the state line mob. Well, um, those of you that haven't seen it, you can see it. I can find you some links and put it out there. But I've always been trying to kind of just push all that aside. I had hundreds of videos, true crime videos on YouTube and on Facebook. At one time, my blog went out to a potential of half a million people. Um, but uh, about three years ago, I made a video, Is This Goodbye? And that's still on YouTube. You can watch it. And it's basically, I had gotten so burnout and hurt uh, from a victim's family member who kind of uh, I'd worked so hard for and then kind of got stabbed in the back and uh, I just couldn't take anymore. So I decided to step away and go on into my study of coaching and psychology and things like that. Well, um, so that's what I've been doing for the last three years. And uh, I will still continue to do that. I will still continue to motivate you and inspire you and coach you and all those things. But I got a notification yesterday. I got a. I woke up and my phone had been exploding overnight, and um, they have decided to open up a 57-year-old cold case that I wrote about in this book. And everyone wanted to know where I was and what my opinion was, and if I'm coming back to Tennessee and all this stuff. Basically, there is. Um, I I named this uh, title of this video. A Cold Case, A Legend, and a Vendetta. The reason I did that is because people don't realize Buford Pusser was a real life sheriff. He was he was um, a powerhouse, six and a half foot tall. Um, he was played by The Rock in one of the latest videos, with the latest movie, which was the farthest from the actual true story. Um, but even the rock wasn't as big as he was. Um, the rock is six foot five, I think. Um, and, and Buford was six, six. Um, and so, I mean, this is a big brute of a man and he was in a very lawless era where the criminals overtook everything and law enforcement was bought off and he refused to be bought off. Well, he made a lot of enemies. 
He, he faced death many times. His face was shot off. But in the process of all this, he was ambushed on New Hope Road, him and his wife. His wife was killed and his face was shot, literally hanging onto his chest. Um, now, 57 years later, they have decided to exhume Pauline Pusser's body because they realize there's no autopsy been done. And we have a few individuals that are in the area that are related to the uh, the criminal element that, that Buford put away. And of course, they've never had any love loss for Buford. Um, but in the process of all of this, they realize uh, there's, there's some specific people that are, are really pushing an old rumor. Um, and they, they think that Buford Pusser killed his own wife and that he shot himself in the face to cover it up. And, um, I can go into that more on some, on some videos, but, uh, the concept is, is there was no autopsy. So now they are, they're going to do an autopsy on Pauline Pusser and we'll know for sure what happened. Um, but all of this, the, the point of this video is all of this has kind of pulled me back into that world of things. And I realized that, um, I'm, I'm more alive and happy and, and, and back digging into my old research. And, and so I wanted to warn you guys and let you know that I will be putting out more true crime content on this page. Um, if that offends you or you don't like it, make sure and go over to my victim to vitality group. Um, that is all, um, life coaching. That's all that will be, uh, ever will be is life coaching. Um, so that will be your safe place if you decide to uh, follow Sonovri Publishing. Uh, and uh, so, um, but for everyone else, uh, that's, I'm going to be focusing on that. I am going to be relaunching my Chasing Justice podcast. It's going to be Chasing Justice Revisited. And it's going to start out by re-releasing all the series on V Free Presser that I did before. And then I'll be making more videos as things happen. But as of right now, they have exhumed Pauline Pusser's body um, and they're going to be doing an autopsy to see, um, you know, basically bullet trajectories and things like that. Um, in the meantime, until we find out what's going on, uh, I will be putting on uh, the things that I've learned from my research and from my interviews with people. Um, and then I will be putting on my 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 opinion, you know, because I've got all of this study in, in psychology and in all those things. So I'll be applying that to um, the behavior patterns of a few people in this case. And we'll go from there. I have uh, cricket on the line. Thanks for signing on. And uh, Dean, uh, Dini, uh, have you heard from Phyllis? I have not heard from her in years. Um, I tried to reach out to her a couple times and got no response and nobody has been able to hear from her in years. And so um, I'm hoping she's okay. But quite frankly, I have been checking obituaries in her state because I haven't heard nothing from her. Um, and um, I hope I'm wrong, um, but I haven't heard anything from her in years. Um, so if you hear from her, let me know that she's still alive because I have no idea. I haven't been able to get a hold of her. Um, for those of you that are wondering, Phyllis is actually part of the first Dixie Mafia book that I wrote about. Um, the first Dixie Mafia book I wrote about was actually about her family. And so, um, no, I have not heard from Phyllis. If you hear from her, um, uh, let me know because I would like to know she's okay. Um, but no, I haven't heard from Phyllis and quite frankly, I haven't heard from anybody because I was trying to get out of the true crime world and, um, realize that this is kind of my calling and this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And, and so I will be putting out more true crime content, but I wanted to let you know that, um, Buford Pusser's wife has been exhumed and they are doing an official autopsy. Um, and uh, I will give you more information as it is released publicly. Of course, um, it's an ongoing investigation, so there's not a lot being released publicly. So um, I can only give you that information, obviously. But uh, once I find out um, something and get the permission to, um, to comment on it, I will definitely let you guys know. Um, and I have opened up a new, uh, true crime stories group. So if you 
are interested in the true crime stories uh, from my past and from the future, make sure and jump on there. And um, I, I've just started it. There's only like 30 something members. I haven't, haven't got it. I haven't got it busted out yet. So, but uh, I wanted to let you guys know about this because this is, um, this is an intense, crazy um story that just keeps going on and it's it just continues um but i wanted to tell you a little bit about this book um this book is uh, dawn of the dixie mafia so this is the book that actually teach it tells you all about um where um where the Dixie Mafia kind of started, how it came over from Phoenix City and and all that. But it also goes very much into detail about the Buford Pusser story. And this is a picture of him out of the book. You can see this is him on a gurney after he was shot in the face in the ambush. And that whole side of his face would have to be reconstructed over several years and several surgeries. And um, so they are, uh, they are looking to see if... Uh, uh, they're trying to discredit this man. And um, I, I'm kind of, uh, I have my opinions and I'm trying to keep them to myself. Let's just put it that way. But the way I look at it is um, he was a lawman from a different era. Nowadays, lawmen can't do the things that he was doing back then. Um, and so that's kind of where I've left it. But this case has just drawn me back again. So I was like, oh, man, I got to, I got to, I got to jump back in and swim. I hope you guys enjoy it. I hope you guys um, promote, and, yeah, not promote, but to follow me and, and help me out here. If you enjoy the content that I'm putting out, please share it. I used to have a huge audience and it kind of breaks my heart. I don't have much anymore. And, and uh, so now I've got to build that again. And so I could use your help. If you guys like what I have, make sure and share it. Um, and like I said, I'll continue the coaching stuff too, because as far as I'm concerned, uh, if you're chasing justice, you've been victimized in whatever capacity, you will never have justice until you learn how to live again and you go from victim to vitality. So you're not going to be able to uh, get a court case won and still get your get justice. You, you get justice by learning how to live again. And that's where all of my life coaching kind of angles to. Also, Tuesday night, this coming Tuesday night, I will be on the NASCA um, blog talk radio show. I'll be doing, I'll be a co-host there and we'll be talking for like 90 minutes um, about uh, different mental health aspects of going from victim to vitality. So if you are interested in that sort of thing, I'll post a link to that. Um, someone said, a Facebook user, it doesn't give me a name. I'm sorry. It says, I'm sorry, I'm late. I was watching you on YouTube. <laughs> hey, that's a perfect reason to be late. I appreciate it. Um, make sure and give me your name though, because it doesn't say who it is. So you'll have to type it out. Sometimes uh, StreamYard has a bad habit of just um, telling me it's a Facebook user and says, uh, will I be able to watch this? Absolutely. It's streaming live on YouTube right now. So it's streaming live and then the, the replay will be available within a few minutes. So, yeah. So, but basically I just come on to tell you, uh, that's what this is all about. This is, um, it's all about the cold case. Buford Pusser's wife is being exhumed. Keith. Hi. Hi, Keith. Uh, um, so, but anyways, that's, that's what I'm talking about is, is, uh, what I had. Oh, and Venus. Keith and Venus, thank you guys for watching. Um, so basically what we want to understand is when, you, when you're studying and researching cold cases, you need to be able to have the capacity to not get sucked into the urban legends. You've got to get all the information and then you've got to take it apart piece by piece. And you need to understand when you're operating with the Dixie Mafia, and this is something that they have done over and over again, the FBI, uh, you know, all the law enforcement, they have proof of this in other cases that the Dixie Mafia was involved in. When they do a job, they automatically start a, a false campaign. So uh, when they did the hit on the judge, Sherry, and his wife in Biloxi, Mississippi, when they did that, they did the hit and then they actively had somebody starting a rumor immediately. 
they had that the judge was corrupt. Then they automatically started laying out false evidence and creating this false narrative to kind of guide law enforcement along. And they, of course, uh, in that case, they they figured out real quick that this was not what was actually happening. But this is a a um, a tactic that the Dixie Mafia uses. They automatically soon as a hit is done, they will start running smear campaigns. And within a few, few, you know, within a short time after the ambush on Buford Pusser, they started some very vicious rumors. And those vicious rumors still continue today. And people think, oh, well, I've heard this since then. I heard this from my grandma. This has to be true. This is a rumor that was started within a few hours of the ambush by the perpetrators of the ambush. And so you want to you want to understand that that's the way the Dixie Mafia works. They automatically have their smear campaign started, you know, and ready to go. So um so this is what we need to understand. We want to really watch this case closely and see what happens because I, the TBI is doing a great job doing their job, um, you know, trying to investigate this case. And, um, and so we're, we're just kind of at a standstill to see what happens with uh, the autopsy reports. But uh, at this point in time, at this point in time, we uh, we're just kind of at their mercy to see what happens. But I want you guys to be aware that this is one of the tactics of the Dixie Mafia. They will start a rumor um, and start a smear campaign the moment of their crime. And then that constantly muddies the water. And I'm afraid that's what we're looking at. 57 years later, um, we're looking at something that was set in place as kind of a false flag event um, for the Dixie Mafia on this case to kind of, uh, kind of overshadow what is actually happening and what those facts really are. And of course, you know, I'm not law enforcement, so I don't have any uh, ability to to tell you what's going on. And of course, if I was law enforcement, I couldn't tell you till it, until everything's approved anyways. But uh, so this is what we want to keep a look at. I want, I want you to understand that there's three basic reasons that I believe um, that I believe that they would have exhumed Pauline Pusser. In this case, 57 years later, um, they have um, they have some certain individuals that are buying into the the um, into the story that Buford Pusser killed his own wife and then shot himself in the face to cover it up. And so they've bought into those rumors enough that they finally going to go ahead and exhume Pauline's body to test it. So that's uh, that's one reason why they could be doing this. Um, another reason why they could be doing this is the the fact that um, they that they they um, they want to the person that Buford Pusser actually thought ordered this hit. Now, so you have to go back to that. The person he thought ordered this hit from the beginning was Kirksey Nix. Now, Kirksey Nix is actually in prison. Kirksey Nix is actually in prison for something else, and he's supposed to die in prison. But he is of a, uh, you know, up in age now, and he's got some health problems, and he's petitioned for an early humanitarian release. Okay, so they could be doing this as uh, the second theory. They could be doing this because they're trying to prove that Kirksey Nix had something to do with it, so they have a reason to keep him in there. Um, so that's that's uh, you know uh, theory number two. Theory number three is if you read the first Dixie Mafia book that I wrote, um, you will see that there was some theories of how the hit went down, and it's a slightly different than the ambush story that we are told publicly. So if you go into that conspiracy line of thinking, um, if you go into that line of thinking, there is, there was actually the hit was still ordered by Kirksey Nix, but it was carried out in a different different way than what we're told publicly. So there's three different options of why I think they could be exhuming the body. I don't necessarily uh, believe in any one of them more than the other. And like I said, I'm not law enforcement. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm a kind of an armchair detective and a researcher, fanatic researcher. But uh, those are the three reasons that I think maybe 
they are doing this now, 57 years later. I don't like the fact that they waited till after his daughter's passed away. Um, I think that is a little sketchy to me. Um, I think maybe um, that kind of makes me lean towards being nervous about this whole thing. Um, because I feel like, you know, if this was a legitimate thing, they could have done an autopsy five years ago. Um, but that's, you know, it could just be timing of things. But uh, that kind of gives you an overview of what I think is going on. And of course, I haven't been involved in this case. I, I don't know. Um, I don't have anything other than the research that I've, I've acquired over time with the Buford Pastor stuff. So I'm kind of at this point waiting like you guys, but I will keep you posted as they release new information. Um, and uh, I, will, I will let you know. In the meantime, if you want to know what I know about it, uh, you can check out my book. It's on Amazon. But uh, my thought is, is um, if this man is a hero and he has, if he is a hero and he gave up everything, including his wife and his own face, to protect those around him, I hope they tread lightly when when they go do their investigation because if he's if he was corrupt and they find that out then that's what happened that's what we have to deal with but on the other hand if he was uh, a hero with a batch i hope that they um they honor that and i hope that they tread lightly because in this day and a in this day and age we have so much anti-police propaganda that I don't think we need anymore. And I feel like um, if it comes down to it, um, I hope they really understand. You're talking about a man who lived in a different era. You can't apply the rules of today to an era where those rules didn't, uh, they, they didn't exist. And so um, that's where, it, I'll, I'll tell you a story. The reason why I'm so hesitant and this is this is the reason why Buford Pusser is not a cut and dry case. He's not a he's not a he's not a an angel in disguise. He's not uh you know some some big legend. He is a country boy, a corn fed country boy, trying to take care of his own, trying not to take bribes from the 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 corruption, trying to clean up his area. Now, does he succeed? I would say no, he doesn't succeed. The state line mob ended up phasing themselves out. Um, did he fight hard? Yes, he did. Uh, did he do the best he could? I think so. Um, but there is one incident where you're talking about mo there was so much uh, corruption in the area. Toehead White was a criminal uh, uh, that was actually quite a bit... Um, he was an, a grade above all the other local criminals. You know, they had all these local thugs. Well, Toehead White was had a massive FBI file. He wanted to be, uh, you know, he he was a big wig criminal. He was in a different, you know, a whole different grade. Uh, but um, Toehead White um, and Buford Pusser were were, you know two bulls charging each other, you know, that that's all there was. They was constant at each other. And Buford Pusser believed that Toehead White and Kirksey Nix were the ones that actually killed his wife. Well, afterwards, his daughter, 10, 12, 13 years old, whatever, um, uh, she would get phone calls at the house while she was there alone with her grandma. Um, and they said they were going to kill her. They were going to uh, leave her body in the swamp. Now, Buford Pusser is a law officer. And at this point, he flips out a bit. They're calling, threatening to murder his daughter and leave her in the swamp. He knows who did it, but he didn't wait to go through the legal channels. He just went to the local bar, picked up Toehead White, threw him in his car, handcuffed him, took him down to the swamp, and made the, th made the guy crawl through the swamp on his hands and knees in his, 
you know, very ex because he always wore very expensive clothes. Um, made him crawl through the swamp on his hands and knees at gunpoint and told him, if you ever threaten my daughter again, I will let this badge go and I will take you out. Now, whether he would have actually done that or not, I don't know. And so people use that against him. They say, well, that's not the way law enforcement's supposed to behave. That's not. And I agree with you. I totally agree with you. But in that instant, me as a mother reading that, I'm thinking, heck yeah. Because as a parent, I'm thinking, I'm not, yeah, you know, I don't necessarily feel any different than that. But see, that is the kind of things that, that, uh, made him on that gray line and he's always operating right there but you also have to understand that the the state line during those years was like the wild west and the only justice there really was was a type of vigilanteness and so do i agree with everything buford pusser did absolutely not you know could he be a law officer nowadays no no, he wouldn't have got by with that. No, not at all. But do I think he murdered his own wife because they were having an argument and then shot his own face off and lived with that for the rest of his life? No, I don't think so. Um, and so that's kind of where I'm at. But that's also the reason why I'm hesitant with Buford Pusser because Buford, um, Buford, the bull is what he was called when he was younger in his wrestling days. He was a bull. And uh, so that was where I kind of hesitate with him because he's not politically correct. Absolutely not politically correct. And nowadays in our perfectly PC world, he doesn't fit. And I feel like that's the reason why you really need to tread softly when you start studying people in history because they lived in an era that doesn't exist now. And uh, so, but anyways, that's kind of where I'm at. And I just wanted to let you know what was going on with me. Um, and uh, I, I still have the Coffee with Sonova podcast coming out. I don't know. I've got like six episodes in the can. Um, and so uh, that's still coming out. But I'm also going to be re-releasing some of my old content about Buford Pusser and uh, being probably making some new content about him. Um just because I feel like it's in the news and you guys need to know what's going on. Okay, I have another Facebook user. Doesn't tell me who you are. Says, holler at me again, please. Um, I need your name to know who I'm hollering at. Um, and then another Facebook user says, are you going to be writing any new books about Buford? I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I have written what I've written and I feel like, um, I feel like there's, so much more you could say about this human being, but I don't know that I'm the right person to do it because I'm not, I'm not family. I don't even live in Tennessee. I probably could, if you want to know the truth, because I, I go down there and after three days, it just sounds like home, you know, because I was raised, uh, I was raised, you know, in the South and, and I, I love the accents and, and I walk back in and I fall right back into mine and, and uh, it just feels like home. I, there, I walk in. And I was like, "Up oh, after three days, I better get out of here, or I'm going to sound like <laughs> sound like I used to." I'm going to because I try to mellow out my accent a little bit. But uh, um, I don't know that I'd be the right person to write about Buford because um, he doesn't have a whole lot of family left. I mean, he's got some grandkids, um, but uh, I don't know that I'd be the right person. I would be honored to if if the information came up and, uh, um, you know, maybe I could get some interviews with the right people. I would be honored to write about him again, but I don't know that I would be the right person to. And uh, so we'll, we'll wait and see. We're going to see what the TBI does with this case, um, uh, what they what they come, what their conclusions are. I hope that everything follows out. Um, uh, I, I hope everything f follows th through and, and they do a good job and they don't let, uh, the investigation be influenced by a vendetta. Um, and so I, I'm assume I'm assured that they are all professionals and they're going to do a good job. Uh, it's just disturbing to see 
uh, I don't know. I think I have a, I have a disturbing feeling about any time that you have to uh, exhume a body. And I think that's just because I hold reverent, you know, and certain things are sacred and, and we, and I hope that they wouldn't make such a drastic move if they didn't have evidence. And, uh, you know, I, I was telling a friend of mine, I said, I was like, you know what, when I'm down there, leave me alone. Don't bother me. You know, so you bother me all my life. Don't bother me after I'm buried, you know? And I, so I've kind of, um, I have that innate kind of repulsion to the concept of exhumations. Um, but I know judges don't take it lightly. They, you know, and, and the family was, um, some of the grandkids were, uh, okay with it. And, and so I was like, okay, there's gotta be something behind the scenes that we're not aware of. Um, Oh, it says you are on target with true crime and shine. I still watch it, Venus. I love you, girl. Um, true crime and shine um, was the title of the episode I did for Moonshiners, and I was a little disappointed in it because they didn't give me any. Um, they didn't give me any promo stuff to promote it, but uh, also the concept was they were wanting to do it, to start that as a premiere, a pilot to a whole new kind of a whole new spinoff series is what it was. And then it got cut down into a regular episode. And so the 10 hours that I recorded ended up coming down to about 15 minutes. And uh, so we didn't get to say what we wanted to say. Maybe they will take that old footage and actually spin it into a pilot one day. I don't know. I hope so. Um, I had a good time on the, on the, on the sets and uh, the sets were the locations. I mean, we went to the woods where, you know, where we could see, um, where we could see all of, you know, where things were, we could only see the, um, the foundations of a few buildings. And then of course we were at the museum, Buford Pusser's home. And, and, uh, every time I stand in there, I just, uh, you know, I'm very kind of empathic person. And so I, I have a picture of me that I didn't share because I was, I was really sick and, and overweight and uncomfortable in front of camera. I was like, why did you have to do this now? But uh, I'm getting myself put back together. So praise the Lord for that. But um, I, uh, I went in, uh, I stood at his kitchen, at his kitchen counter and uh, was just looking around. And I thought, I don't know, just had this deep ache you know, in your soul, uh, you could still feel the pain in that house, um, that everybody went through. I mean, you could feel, um, you could feel the trauma that was left in that house. Um, he, all of his stuff is still there. I mean, this, you know, you see all the, all the pictures, all the stuff in his Bible. Oh my gosh. I have a picture of his Bible. That thing, was beat all to pieces. And I'm like, I, I took a picture of it and I showed my husband who was so graciously took me and the children with him and he would babysit the kids while I was working. Um, I showed him, I looked, I said, look at that right there. I said, that is someone who was, who was, who was looking for answers. That was someone who was fighting his demons. Someone who, cause see people said, well, he took out a couple people in his, in his career as a law enforcement, he ended up, uh, two people ended up being killed by him in shootouts. And he said that every night he, he saw their faces, you know, it wasn't a cop that was using vigilante justice to kill people. Um, he saw their faces every night and he mourned that things happened the way they did. And, uh, you could tell it, you know, he, he, his drinking increased afterwards and he, um, he beat his Bible to death. I mean, it was, it, it looked like it had been through a car accident. Um, and, and I don't know, it may have, I don't know. It doesn't say anything. There was no signs to say that it was in the car or anything. If it was, it would have been burned up. So I guess it wasn't, but, um, so I, I don't know, but I remember standing in that, in that place, uh, after the cameras, cause we, we stayed there and then everyone was loading up to go to the location. Um, and uh, the Shamrock Motels, where we were going, uh, what was left of it. And I remember just standing there while everybody was leaving and just a few minutes of quiet. And it was just like, 
so much pain was in that house. So much trauma. Um, I don't know how anyone could stand it. It, it, it. it was overwhelming. I have a picture of it. I might share it. I don't know. I, I'm not happy with the way I looked in the picture, but, um, but it was just a moment. And I felt like right or wrong, this man suffered for, for what he thought was right. And he stood up for stuff that he thought was right. And to me, that's what attracts me to this case. Whether he was right or whether he was wrong, whether we, whatever we find out, I feel like he tried to stand up for something. And so many people nowadays, they have such fiery opinions about things, but then when push comes to shove, they won't stand up for nothing. And, and I hate that. I hate that about our society. We get online and we are mouthy sacks of crap. We'll say whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll judge people. We'll destroy people with our tongues. And yet in person, we wouldn't stand up for nothing. And I think that's what pulls me into this case. And uh, I think that's what keeps me coming back over and over and over again. And so, uh, you know, I thought, in your life, if there's something you truly believe in, you need to stand up for it. Don't just mouth about it on Facebook. You need to stand up for it. Now, I got somebody else that says, Helen Pusser must have thought a lot of me because after we talked on the phone, she sent me letters and pictures of Buford. I have them in frames today and some wallet pictures. Venus. Oh, I'm so jealous. That's awesome. I never, by the time I got into this case the first time, um, Helen was gone and so was Dewana. It was right after Dewana passed away that I got involved in this case. And uh, I, I, I regret it. It's like, man, if I would have just got into this six months earlier, I, I would have, I would have got to talk to Diwana. Um, and I, so I never, I never got the honor to talk to her. So I'm so jealous, Venus. I'm so jealous. <laughs> so, but okay. Well, I, I'm sorry this video was rambling on so much. Uh, I just uh, wanted to tell you guys what's going on with me, what's going on with Sonova Inc. Publishing. Um, and if you are interested in these kinds of cold cases, make sure and um, make sure and check out my true crime stories group um, and uh, get on there and uh, we will we will see where this leads. I don't know. I'm going to jump in this one because this one I feel passionate about. Um, we'll see. We'll see if there's another case after this. See if there's another case in Sonova. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, after this um after this one, we'll see what happens. I'm not sure where it's going to go after this, but this is one that I have to, I have to get in and fight. I have to get in and do something because, um, I feel like, uh, I feel like, um, I feel like he stood up for something. It's time for me to stand up for something, you know? And so we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Uh, and, uh, like I said, I'll let you know as soon as anything public comes my way. Um, of course, if I'm um, privileged to get involved in anything that I have to keep private, I, I will have to do that. Um, but uh, I'm so far from this case now, I doubt that they get me involved. Um, but if they do, I will be most grateful to help out any way that I can. I hope I see you guys later. And uh, thanks for listening to me ramble for half an hour. Love you all.